in, in, in this week's um, session, we uh, have been reading in, in the sections around 30, and section 31 is a really astonishing section where he begins with one of the great poetic lines to emerge out of science. It could only have come out of a study of science, and that is, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. He's still answering that question that the child asked him way back at the beginning of the poem, but, but now he's got a kind of answer that has a scientific aura about it. Um, and it's not just a metaphor. It's, it's not actually, a metaphor. Scientifically, yeah. it's an exact demonstration, isn't it? It is, and and he he looks at all the things around him. Uh, he has one of the earliest lines uh, that we can trace to leaves of grass is in this section, section thirty one, and the cow crunching with depressed head surpasses any statue. He says. He's always been fascinated with that cow crunching the grass. It seems to be, in some ways, maybe the er image for all of Song of Myself, because it's that image of the ruminating cow, the cow that that is eating the grass, that's turning the grass into the beef that becomes us. We die, become the soil, which becomes the grass, which becomes the cow, which becomes us. And he begins to see this ecological cycle that science is now teaching him. So that when he then goes on in section 31 to say, I find I incorporate nice, coal, long-threaded moss, fruits, grains, us esculent roots and am stuccoed with quadrupeds and birds all over. He's, he's thinking now of, of, of that nine months of gestation. Every one of us has at some root level of our being experienced being a one-celled animal. We all began that way. And we've experienced living in a totally fluid environment. We lived in the womb. We, we know what it was like to have a tail. We all had tails. We all chew the cud. <laughs> we all chew the cud. We, we, we develop, we develop uh, 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 all, all of the uh, uh, characteristics that become birds' wings, that become turtles, carapaces, all of the things are there in embryo. Every part of the universe. Every part of the universe. A, a, a leaf of grass is the journey work of the stars. You know, that, that conception that to look at that leaf of grass, to see in those altering, shifting, changing, growing items out of that leaf of grass, the atoms that were there at the beginnings of the universe, mm -hmm. the atoms that from any distance out in the cosmos look to anyone looking back at the earth from out there like a part of the distant cosmos to them. It's all the journey work of the stars. And in fact, it was the journey work, the journey from one star to this planet that brought those carbon molecules that made possible the beginning of life. That's right. This reminds me of a conversation we were having last summer about Whitman and science. Maybe we should listen to a few minutes of that now. Whitman's vocabulary in Song of Myself is always expansive. He coins words, and he's bringing into the poem the many languages of, of science, the emerging sciences of the 19th century, astronomy, geology. Uh, he's giving us a, a big picture of the universe, and that seems to be one of the uh, the guiding principles of the poem, isn't it? Yeah, he, he was fascinated with every development in science, kept up with them through the burgeoning um, uh, magazine uh, market. Every time there'd be a new uh, uh, magazine piece on, on science, he would mark it up and cut it out and, uh, and, and put it into, into, the his, into his scrapbooks yeah. of various sorts. Um, he, 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 everything in the 19th century was uh, 
Well, and we are living with it today. It's it, it was it was the the the. the the battle of science against what had been thought of as a religious conception of the world. So a scientific conception of the world and the religious conception were really uh, 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 beginning to battle it out in the mid-19th century. And so many people were retreating from uh, the uh, ways that science was exploding open the universe, exploding open time, and exploding open space. Uh, Astronomy was moving the Earth more and more into a dust particle on the edge of a galaxy, which was on the edge of the vastness of a universe that was unimaginably large and that had been here for unimaginable billions of years, evolving and shifting and changing. And so the conception of a Earth-centered universe with a god nearby uh, uh, began to seem uh, uh, to quickly for many people fade more and more into a, a sort of uh, mythic storied past. And for Whitman, he really became the first poet of science. You know, he said, okay, scientists, bring me all these yeah. new things and let me make poetry out of it, you know. People are saying that all of these new scientific uh, uh, understandings and truths are making humans seem smaller and smaller. And, I look at this and I say, no, no, it's making us larger and larger, Expensive. vaster and vaster. You know, we're, we, we are part of a vastness that we had never had, had imagined or conceived of. And the, the atoms that were there at the very first the explosion that began this massive universe were right here in me. We're all part of the same Stardust. Thing. You, you give 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 me the 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 vastest thing you can give me, and I will show you how it makes me even more vast. Mm -hmm. Evolution. So you're telling me that at one point uh, uh, I was carbon. That's terrific. I I loved lying there for those millions mm -hmm. of years and gathering that energy that would be released uh, someday. Um, the, this, the, the, the sense of dinosaurs, that's great. I, 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 I can still feel how that dinosaur carried my egg in its mouth and, and, uh, and, and, and nurtured me through, through the years. Um, it's, it, it's a kind of amazing vision that Whitman presents, and it has to do, again, with that uh, uh, desire for fullness and completeness, that democratic desire that everything had its place. I think in the, the midst of all the scientific and technological uh, uh, discoveries and advances during Whitman's time, one that he really latched onto was photography. Mm -hmm. Photography began as, uh, in this country with daguerreotypes uh, when he was 20 years old and, um, uh, and he started to get photographed and photographers loved him because he was a, a, a powerful looking, tall, uh, gorgeous human specimen. And so sometimes photographers would just call him off the street and say, can I take your, your, your portrait? Uh, but what Whitman loved about photography and what, what many commentators in the 19th century hated about photography was that when the first photographs were viewed and looked at, uh, uh, commentators like Oliver Wendell Holmes in the Atlantic Magazine, who wrote at length about photography, said, "You know, this is this is a this is a scientific technological way of looking at the world that teaches us really why we have artists because photography." Uh, puts in all the debris, all the, the, the details that, that artists can see don't really belong there. And artists clean up that, that uh, image of reality for us and teach us what it is important that we actually see and teach us the beautiful. And Whitman said, no, yeah. no. Photography teaches us a democratic way of seeing yeah. and for the first time now we can see what the world actually looks like and what it looks like is a very cluttered place. It's filled with detail and every detail counts. Counts. It has its place. And, and he doesn't dismiss the religious view of the world because he's always invoking religious figures and prophets through the ages as a part of that unfolding story. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And everything, everything has its place. Yeah. That's what that's what photography teaches. Whitman said, all right, here it is, the democratic conception of beauty. Beauty is not discrimination, taking out the things we consider ugly and leaving the things we consider beautiful. Democratic beauty is fullness, fullness of representation, everything having its place. So in the most cluttered photograph, you see the democracy of reality around you. Just as he would love going to a concert and seeing everybody pull out their iPhones today to take pictures <laughs> of the band or the crowd uh, or everything on the way in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it it, it is a a, a digital uh, a digital conception of uh, the world. Yeah. Uh, again, 150 years before we had any idea that we could that we could capture all of uh, all of reality with uh, such uh, exactitude, yeah. such fidelity. Yeah, and it's 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 beautiful too the way that we see it all through Song of Myself the way that scientific discoveries, evolution. Uh, and uh, the, the, the new discoveries about uh, geological uh, uh, development and formation, all of those things get these amazing, powerful, beautiful poetic descriptions. Even in a, a, a poem he wrote around, uh, around the time of the Civil War uh, called When I Heard the Learned Astronomer, and, uh, that, that, that little poem in which he imagines listening to the lecture where the astronomer's putting up all the facts and figures and teaching him about the vastness of the of the universe and he gets a little bored with all the facts goes and outside goes outside and then he he has this amazing moment where he, he in that little poem he goes outside and he says from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars and for years I read that poem thinking, how odd that little phrase from time to time, you know, because it sounds like it's a dismissive phrase, now and then I'd look up at the stars. It didn't make any sense because he's so overwhelmed by what he sees when he looks up at the stars. And then it hit me. That's what he's learned from the astronomer. Yeah. We look from time to time. We're looking from our time to another time. Every time we look at the sky, we're time traveling. We're looking across time. And for the first time, he can now walk out and look up at the sky and understand that because of what the astronomer taught him. He doesn't reject it. He accepts it and turns it into poetry. And, and he takes that a cliched phrase from time to time and actually return, restores its original power. Yeah, from restores its power the and and pulls uh, what at the time was maybe 15 years old uh, scientific uh, discovery about the, the, the light traveling at uh, certain speeds and being able to measure across the universe how, just how far light has traveled so that when we're looking at a star we may be looking across a hundred years, we may be looking across a thousand years, we may be looking across a, a million years. Well, this is really interesting because I have I have always read this poem uh, as Whitman's sort of dismissal of the scientific view of things. But in fact, you're suggesting something radically different, aren't you? Yeah, I, I am, um, and I think it's I think it's the way Whitman looks at science always. Uh, that is that that the scientists give him the materials out of which he's going to make his poetry. I mean, I think in um, in uh, Song of Myself to the passage uh, in section 23 when he says, Hurrah for positive science, long live exact demonstration. And he goes on and he talks about this is the lexicographer, this the chemist, this made a grammar of the old cartouches, these mariners put the ship through dangerous unknown seas, this is the geologist, this works with the scalper, and this is the mathematician. Gentlemen, to you, the first honors always. Your facts are useful, and yet they are not my dwelling. I but enter by them to an area of my dwelling. So a lot of people read that passage and say, well, you know, Whitman is, is saying, yeah, science is important, but it's not finally what he's really interested in. But what he's really saying there, I think, is 
it's it's the new entryway for the poet. It's the new entryway through a, 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 an understanding of a vastly different world and universe. So that in the learned astronomer poem, when he walks out to look at the sky he's looked at his whole life, after the scientist, after the astronomer has given him the materials to understand the way light travels, suddenly that sky, which has always been pretty cool, now is mystical and vast and he's looking across time and he may be seeing things, he may be seeing the light of stars that do not now, whatever now is, exist. They're, they're, they're gone, but they're there for us because we exist at this point in time, those stars exist at another point in time, but the light brings us together in the same way that is poetry would always be set up for the reader 150, 200 years in. Written in his time, available to us now in our time. I wonder, the, the, langu the, the, the language of science in, this po in his poem is uh, handled so seamlessly. It doesn't seem as if he's shoehorning in scientific discoveries. It seems as if it's all of a piece. Is that just a function of us catching up to him 150 years later? or? How was it viewed in his time? Well, I, I, the, the interesting thing about uh, uh, readers in his own time, they really were looking at uh, scientific uh, uh, advancement as diminishing more and more the poetic in the world. Mm -hmm. right? Eventually everything would be explained, mystery would be gone, um, and uh, 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 rationality would uh, would completely conquer and take over, and so religion, uh, poetics, uh, even uh, philosophy, in some key ways, all seem to be retreating from science. And what people in his own time were amazed at when they read Whitman's poetry was here was a poet who, instead of retreating from science, was entering through science into a whole new mystery and vastness that he could begin to talk of. You think you've known mystery, Whitman would say? Let me show you what science is opening up to us as mystery. You think the self was mysterious before? Try thinking of it being made up of little bits and pieces that were here from the very beginning of the universe and will be here through all eternity. We are part of a never-ending, ongoing process, and it's a material thing as well as a spiritual thing. What we've been calling spiritual all these endless eons of time may, in fact, be the mystery of the material. When we were talking last summer, Ed, about uh, Whitman and science, and we were discussing uh, the learned astronomer, I was thinking to myself, early on that I had often imagined that poem as a kind of anti-science poem, but in fact, it's much bigger than that. It incorporates all the different ways of looking at the world. You mentioned that the uh, democratic beauty is the fullness of representation, and it seems to me that what Whitman is doing is finding a way to represent all the different ways of being in the world, trying to give us different representations of our place here in the universe. Yeah, and, and again, in, in uh, this, the readings for this session, we have that massive Section 33, that uh, huge catalog, which is a, a, a kind of formal response to that very notion that democratic beauty is fullness of representation. Mm -hmm. We just move from image to image to image. No image getting more than a line. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't dwell on any particular image. No image begins to occupy our attention more than the other images. No hierarchy of value here. No hierarchy. Everything is flattened out with this, with this style of uh, equal line for perception. Perception by perception, mm -hmm. moment by moment. Uh, the the poet gives over a line, no more, no less, mm -hmm. to what has come to his body's attention at that particular moment. And so we get a kind of formal 
uh, demonstration in poetry. I, I sometimes think of, of Whitman looking at his at, at, the, at the page, the poetic page, the blank page, as a, as a kind of photographic plate, just open to everything in the world that is going to come to his senses, and trying to figure out how on that page he can create the same kind of clutter of detail mm -hmm. that, a, that a photographic plate opens itself up to yeah. Uh, so that when the sun shines upon it, everything that is in the field of vision has its place. Yeah.